lecture to welcome Dr. Benon Pudehimi today as our speaker for this webinar. This is the second webinar uh, as a part of the webinar, webinar series of the Itefor Academy of Force Media, uh, which was recently established. Dr. Pudehimi is a William A. Kropman Distinguished Professor in the Wilson College of Textile at the North Carolina State University. He also serves as the Associate Dean in the College of Textile and the Executive Director of the non woven Institute, which is the largest university-based institution in the U.S. Uh, he's best known for his tremendous contributions to non woven uh, fields. For his work on filtration, he has won uh, O. Max Gardner Award in 2015 and also uh, Holiday Medal of Excellence in 2018. Since 2020, Dr. Purdehimi is a fellow in National Academy of Inventors. Uh, his work has resulted in three books, more than 400 journal publications, and more than 65 international patterns and more than 25 uh, national patterns. I tried really hard to uh, summarize uh, Dr. Purdehimi's contributions to the field. Uh, that was the best I could do, but if I want to continue, you have take, uh, taken <laughs> way more time. So with that, uh, before I uh, we start the talk, I want uh, I want to ask everybody to type down their questions in the chat box. The talk will be around 45 to 50 minutes. After that, we'll read the questions and hopefully we'll have enough time to go over all the questions. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Dr. Fudehimi and ask him to start a talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, delighted to be uh, participating in this activity. Um, the outline of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll go very little into the basics of filtration, then we'll talk about the different types of masks, respirators, test methods, and there's a lot of confusion in terms of some of the test methods. I'll highlight some of the challenges. Um, um, I'll, I'll try and finish with cloth masks and, and then the new barrier mask standard that um, just happened in the U.S. And I'll finish by talking about um, what we expect in terms of the, the standards um, over the next six months. If you look at essentially what we try to protect against, uh, the, these are primarily droplets and aerosols. Um, and of course, um, this, this is a picture um, from um, the university in, in Munich, where they looked at uh, essentially what happens when somebody sneezes. And uh, one of the most challenging things that we, we have to uh, worry about is actually the aerosols because the, the virus is gonna become in the form of an aerosol and might stay in the air depending on the size for a long time. Uh, there was another uh, research that was recently completed that um, shows essentially what happens. And this is fortunately a healthy cough. And you notice that um, you know, during the sneeze, you, you have um, formations of sheets, uh, filaments, ligaments, uh, drop, droplets, respiratory droplets. And, um, and of course, they, they, they travel for a very long distance. And so uh, this is primarily one of the challenges that I think uh, we, we're trying to uh, protect against. So as a summary, we're looking at droplets, um, and this is really one of the most important reasons for everybody to wear a, uh, a mask, um, this is to really protect the others. Uh, but then the aerosols, um, and then these are of course things that can stay in, in, in the air for a long period, um, and most of the N95 respirators that we have are really designed to protect against aerosols primarily, but of course they also protect against droplets. And I'll, I'll sort of talk about the differences between the different types of um, devices that we have and, and, and how they work and, and what they intend to do. In terms of the, um, what we care about, uh, of course filtration efficiency is, is very, very important. We look at the particulate efficiency. Uh, we look at the breathing resistance, basically the, the pressure drop. We wash for leakage. Um, and this is very, very significant because leakage essentially renders that respirator essentially ineffective. Um, and then one thing that we always worry about and ignore uh, is the wear time. And, and what I mean by that is that most respirators 
cannot be worn for extended periods of time. You have to take a break um, because the pressure drops are very high. And of course, unfortunately, the pressure drop continues to increase. You know, the, the structures that we use are really good at capturing particulates, but then your pressure drop continues to increase uh, as you begin to expel particles, as you breathe, cough, talk, as well as capturing particles from the outside. And so therefore the, pressure, the initial pressure drop um, really has nothing to do with how the filter performs. And this is something that a lot of people ignore, but it's a very, very critical element in terms of the design of that respirator. Uh, in terms of the coronavirus, uh, there was actually a recent publication out of China where they looked at uh, a lot of different coronaviruses and the range is somewhere around 60 to 40, 240 nanometers. Um, now, of course, the, the, again, as I mentioned earlier, most of the viruses are gonna be in the form of an aerosol. So they're gonna be carried with something else. So the chances are that your size is actually a little bit larger and, um, and that's not necessarily good news because we, we know that the, um, the larger particles around 0.3 microns are really the critical ones that we have to worry about. If you look at the filtration mechanism, essentially you really have four uh, mechanisms. So when you have large particles, you have initial impaction where the fiber um, is, is shown here, and this is the air trajectory. Um, the particle basically deviates, and if it impacts the, um, the fiber, the chances are that it will be caught. Um, now there's a whole bunch of discussion about particle rebound and things of that sort. That, that's really more for HVAC type of filters, but not for respirators. Uh, interception is where the uh, particle completely follows the trajectory of the air and basically walks through the structure. Uh, now, if you look at a non-woven as a porous medium, it's very different from other porous media. We don't really have pore sizes. We have bundles of capillaries and we talk about tortuosity and things of that sort. Um, so therefore, the chances are with, with the wrong structure um, that the particles that are in the right range could essentially walk through the structure very easily. When you get to very small particles, uh, then you get into the Brownian diffusion where uh, the chances are that it'll take a random walk and it'll touch the fiber and if it touches the fiber, it will get caught. For respirators um, and face masks, electrostatic attraction is incredibly important. Um, because if you simply look at the mechanical efficiency, which is the first three principles, um, we're not going to be able to capture the bulk of the particles that we're interested in at the right pressure drop. So therefore, we depend on electrostatic attraction to really boost that filtration efficiency while reducing the pressure drop and the breathing resistance. Uh, these are a couple of simple animations. Um, that um, I'll, I'll see if it works. Around the up and over a car. Just shows you the uh, basically the airstream around the fiber. And that was a Brownian diffusion. This is the one that just walked right through the structure. Of course, the implication of that is that if, if this was a tube, so just imagine that this is somebody's lung or a, a capillary in the system. Um, you know, the particles that go through, if they're large, they get caught. If they're small, very small in the brain and diffusion regime, they also get caught. But if the particle is of the right size that follows interception, it could actually go right through the structure. And if, if it goes into your lungs, you could actually cough it back up. Um, so, um, that's the kind of thing that we worry about because that, that's what really renders most of these structures ineffective. And if you look at the filtration mechanism, if you put all those mechanisms together, you essentially come up with a total efficiency curve that, that's also shown here. And you look at, depending on the particle size, you're in different regimes. And uh, this is the regime that we worry about because all of the standards are basically uh, those are, are around this, this area. And of course, this dip is called the most penetrating particle size of the MPPS. And um, that's again, what we worry about. Um, and most of the standards are based on that. This is just to demonstrate three actual commercial media. Uh, when you look at uh, the filters before being discharged, so we are removing the electrostatic charge 
So you go more than 99.9% down to 40%. In this case, you're going down to about 10%. So this demonstrates how critical the electrostatic charge is. And of course, one question related to that is how stable that charge is because that charge could be lost uh, depending on the environment that it comes in contact with. And so there's a lot of um, magic that goes into creating um, more stable permanent electrostatic charge. And there are thousands of patents just dealing with this particular aspect of respirators. Of course, if you look at really fine particles, you're, you're between um, you know, less than 0.1 micron, you're in the diffusion regime where the gas molecules essentially are bouncing around. And uh, this is where the particle uh, essentially is being bounced around, takes a Brownian motion. And of course, this is also uh, critical in terms of uh, the temperature at which uh, this happens. And of course, uh, the smaller the particle, the, the more the, the motion will be. All right, so if you look at, uh, essentially what we look at, we look at the uh, particle efficiency. So we look at um, essentially the total number of particles that we generate and how many are caught by the fiber. Uh, we look at the pressure drop, and then, of course, in, in almost every model that we have, um, we assume that we have a uniform fiber diameter and, and particle size, and that's really not the, not the case. But one of the critical elements of the structures that we have is that the processes are not designed to make a unimodal fiber diameter distribution. You get a very broad fiber diameter distribution. And there are challenges with the processes where you get what I call roping and other uh, entangling and and then and so therefore the fiber diameter distribution is typically very broad and um, so we, we have challenges in terms of how to model these structures and of course we, we look at the phase velocity and look at the pressure drop across that filter and of course pressure drop is additive uh, but this one shows a basic simulation that shows essentially the airflow around the fibers. So this is the cross section of the non-woven that we would be using. And of course, if your particle size is in the right range, you'll basically follow that airstream and completely go through the filter. And of course, it's interesting I put this in because today one of the best models that we have is actually an empirical model that's very, very old. Uh, Davies created this, but, but essentially it really talks about three things. So the solidity is important or the one minus porosity is for, of course important, but then the fiber diameter becomes really, really critical. And of course, phase velocity is very critical. And, um, and these, there, there are elements of this, of course, what we can control in the filter is primarily the solidity and the fiber diameter distribution and or the average fiber size. And that, that really controls your, your mechanical filtration. If you look at the, um, current respirators that we have are actually not very old. The, the first uh, actual respirator was 1967, but what's really interesting is that the, the current molded N95 type of mask uh, goes back only to 1985. And of course, uh, there were two discoveries by 3M. Of course, one, they what they did was essentially they, they created um, uh, a malplone structure that had electrostatic charge, and then they created the form factor that, that would give you a good fit. And so you would have minim minimal leakage. Of course, since then, there have been thousands of patents trying to build on these, but the technology is not very, very old. If you look at the types of devices that are out there, we call them respirators and surgical masks or medical masks, depending on who you talk to, but of course, respirators are a personal protective device or the PPE. Uh, they're supposed to have a really good fit. And of course, there's different versions of these. Uh, some of them are air purifying respirators. Uh, some uh, basically have power, some don't have power. So there are many different versions of these. There's the medical version as well as the industrial version. And then the surgical medical mass of those as I call them really the, the cheaper pleated uh, three layer structures that, that everybody's using. And the main difference is that respirators are really intended to protect the person who's wearing the mask, uh, surgical masks or not. Uh, the only thing that they protect against really is the fluid resistance. So that if you had blood or bodily fluids come in contact, they would have a 
fairly good resistance to uh, keeping that away from the skin of the person who's wearing it. But wearing these would actually protect the other people. So when, when we wear these in a medical setting, it's really to protect the, the, the surroundings and the patients more than the person who's wearing it, except the fluid resistance. There's many different types of these, of course. Um, and if you look at respirators, we have the N95, and then you have the elastomeric respirators, or sometimes we call them reusable, that use filter inserts. We have powered air purifying respirators. And then unfortunately, over the last year, we've had cloth masks. And, um, and this has been really the wild west because uh, there are a lot of things on the market that really provide uh, no function. And, um, and that should say Germany has banned. So there's a typo, um, the use of some of these cloth masks in public settings. And I think we are moving towards that in the US. But of course, uh, it may be a little too late uh, for doing that. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back to this because I think there's been a working group uh, initiated by actually the non-woven industry association here approached CDC and said, we have to do better than this. And then CDC um, contacted uh, FDA and OSHA and ASTM, and they've been developing some new guidance in this area. And I'll, I'll conclude my talk today by talking about what's happening in that, that domain. Um, if you look at this typical surgical mask, you have two layers of spun bond um, and one layer of meltblone. The meltblone is always charged. Um, meltblone filters are really fragile. Uh, the fine fibers, uh, they, they don't really have a lot of uh, integrity. So they have to be protected by the spun bond, which is a stronger fabric and larger fiber. If you look at the N95, you could have as, as little as actually three, as, as many as six layers. Um, if you look at the cup mask, you typically have another non-woven that's really the moldable cup. And then you, you basically lay a melt bone or two layers of melt bone on top of that. And then you protect it with a spun bond. Again, the key is that the melt bone is charged. There have been attempts to use electrospun fibers and other kinds of things. And they really haven't taken off because most polymers that we can readily electrospin don't lend themselves to charge stability. And so many of the electrostatic, um, many of the uh, electrospun uh, structures lose the electrostatic charge. And of course, the process is a little bit more challenging in that it uses solutions as opposed to melt. Uh, in the way of introduction, if you look at the melt blown, so this is our melt blown pilot facility. Um, and so essentially, so if you look at this, um, this is about uh, eight meters tall. You make ultra fine fibers. This is actually a really good melt bone structure. It doesn't show a lot of defects. And these machines are typically 1.6, 2.4, 3.2, 4.2 meters wide. You typically slit the fabric to the width that you require for the mask machine. We use a lot of additives and these additives are basically charge enhancers and charge stabilizers, two different um, reasons we do that. And, um, and the, the process is, is fairly fast. Um, you know, in industry, typically these machines, if you have just one of these, uh, you would be running anywhere from 30 to 60 meters a minute, depending on how good you are in, in terms of making these products. And so they're not, they're not really bad. In terms of uh, kilograms per meter per hour, you're looking at anywhere from 30 to 60 kilograms per meter per hour. If you look at the spun bond, it's a different beast. And this shows um, two beams of spun bond. Um, so this would be what we would call an SS. This could be as, 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 as much as um, 15 to 20 meters tall. Um, and of course, much, much higher throughput. The fibers are typically in the range of 15 microns or larger. Um, the machines are pretty large. And of course, the spun bond, um, when you form the structure, you have to thermally bond it, or chemically or thermally or mechanically bond it. This is showing a thermal calendar where you fuse the fibers together to essentially hold the structure together. These are continuous filaments. And the throughput on these machines is much, much faster. I mean, if you look at uh, the same kilograms per meter per hour, um, on one of these, we could be as much as 450 to 500 kilograms per meter per hour. And of course, if you translate that to the weight of the fabric, you could be running in several hundred meters per minute or even higher than that. 
Um, this is a typical surgical mask machine. Um, and uh, There's different versions of these, but they all essentially have the exact same elements. You unwind the, the fabrics, um, you, you have a pleating station, you have a station where you make a coupon. Basically, this is the, the body of the mask where you ultrasonically seal the edges. This machine is faster than the ear loop station. So typically then you send it to two ear loop stations. Now you attach the ear loop and then comes back here and then goes to a packaging. And I will actually show you a video of one of our pilot facilities for masks. And uh, so you can see how, how these are produced. So this is the end of the machine where everything is stacked. And of course, sometimes you package these manually as this is done here. Um, this is the ear loop station, pulls the headband. So this is the beginning of the machine where you're unwinding those three layers. You go through a pleating station. And these fingers here are really important to keep the, those pleats in place. Uh, you, you attach, you, you put a wire nose, um, you attach uh, that, and then you, you cut it into the coupons. And then comes back here, goes into the two stations, and you grab the ear loop and uh, cut it and attach it ultrasonically to the end of the machine. Um, these machines can run anywhere. You know, the, the, the bad ones run about 30 a minute. The good ones can run two, three, four hundred masks a minute. So they are actually pretty fast. This is the end where you're packaging them and shipping them out. Now the um, N95 structure is a completely different beast. Um, and all, this is actually our pilot facility in collaboration with one of our partners. Um, so essentially you have to come in, you unwind, you have to mold the cup and then you have to wrap the top with the melt loan and then put a spun bond and ultrasonically attach that. Then you um, attach a nose wire and then the head strap. So the main difference is that all N95s must have a head strap, not a, an ear loop. Uh, so this is the molding station where you essentially are now stamping that out. You, you take it from one station and put it into the other station and you have a, uh, another that you put on top. And then it's going to here, we attach the nose wire. And then it goes and you attach, in, in this case, you don't ultrasonically attach the head strap, you actually staple it. And um, these machines are much slower. Um, so typically, uh, if you did 15 to 30 a minute, you would be dancing on the streets because these, you know, molding these takes time. And that's one of the challenges that they have. And what people are trying to innovate by decoupling that process, but that, that's the challenge with the process. Of course, these are different forms of uh, respirators uh, and, and masks. So these are the elastomeric ones with the cartridges. And you notice the cartridges are really long. And the reason for that is, again, that face velocity I talked about, because if you make these really small, then not only are you not going to pass the certification, your pressure drop is going to be ultra high. Um, we also have these that have uh, the exhalation valve. Of course, over the last year, we've banned them because this is, this is a really good way of um, giving whatever you, you have to the people in the room by exhaling, because um, these, these valves open when you exhale. And uh, these are really designed for the N99 and N100 filters because those have pretty high pressure drops. Uh, but currently they're banned in, in public use. And uh, so that shows you the, uh, the valve. And if you look at the regulatory bodies that we have in the US, we really have three, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but the respirators are regulated by NIOSH. Um, so the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and of course, in Europe, we, we call them filtering face pieces, so the FFP. And it's really interesting because we've begun using the same terminology in the US over the last year. And of course, you, you have the European Committee for Standardization that, that manages that. But going back to the US regulating bodies, you, you really have OSHA who sits on the top. Um, OSHA is responsible for occupational safety and health. And they um, are really responsible for workplaces as well as healthcare industry. Uh, so if you work in a setting where you must wear a respirator, it's OSHA who will dictate 
all the rules and regulations. And OSHA requires a fit for respirators. And so everyone in the workplace has to be fitted to make sure that they have a correct mask, correct size mask, as well as teaching people how to wear one of these respirators. Then we have the um, FDA, uh, basically anything that's uh, a medical device uh, uh, will be um, under FDA guidance. Uh, of course, they've, they've been issuing emergency use authorizations in the past year to get some products into the marketplace. And then you have NIOSH that really governs the performance of the respirators and they do the testing and certification of the respirators. So when we talk about an N95, that essentially means it's a NIOSH certified uh, respirator. Th there's an area where they come together because we have a cl classification here where these are surgical N95 respirators. So if you see an N95S, that doesn't mean it's small, it means that it's also a surgical mask. And all that really means is that you meet all the requirements of the N95, but you also have the fluid resistance. You have the fluid barrier. And that's the main difference between these. Let's look at the, uh, the testing. Um, of course, uh, what CDC has stated is that um, they're really looking for that most penetrating particle size. And they say it's about 0.3 microns because depending on your charge, uh, you could be 0.2, you could be 0.25, you could be 0.3. So the charge really matters. Um, they have fixed everything. So you, you actually test the device at 85 liters a minute. You have to precondition it for a day. And then they tell you, well, you have to meet the 95 or 99 or 99.7, depending on your classification in terms of filtration efficiency. But then they set some bars for the inhalation and exhalation pressure drop. We do use a charged neutralized aerosol to just make it more difficult. And then the other thing they do is they do a loading test. Um, and because what they learned very early on was that as you begin to load the, um, the mask with aerosol, the filtration efficiency could actually change. And I'll show you some examples of that. And um, so we do have procedures that are very well established and um, guidance that uh, they've provided in terms of how to do these. And then there's also a standard machine to do the tests with. If you look at in the US, we don't really have an equivalent yet uh, compared to the FFP1 in Europe. Uh, so our N95 has to be more than 95 and 99 and then 99.97, really not that different from what you have in Europe with one difference that in Europe, you actually are at a higher flow rate. I believe it's about 90 liters a minute instead of um, 85 liters a minute, but uh, slightly higher flow rate, which of course matters. This is the procedure. So the, these are actually uh, in the public domain. You can download them from the NIOSH website. Uh, so this is the procedure we would use for the inhalation, exhalation, and the particle loading and the testing. Of course, we have the medical grade, uh, the N95s, and these are um, when we do the testing, we use salt as the challenge medium, but when we look at the industrial ones, we would use oil as a challenge medium. These do not require conditioning, uh, but the N95 does require conditioning. And part of that is that the oil is a, is a lot more unfriendly towards polypropylene as, as the medium that we, we would use. And um, so you do not need the conditioning for that. In terms of the NIOSH certification, you really need two things. You need of course, all of the data, you have to have pre-certification and then you send um, 20 masks to NIOSH and they do their own testing. And then you have to also have a quality control plan that you can, that they, that they can send. And then because these are going into a medical facility, uh, the facility that makes it has to also be FDA approved. So lots of regulations. And uh, the machine that we use is a TSI-8130. Um, there's actually um, a European model and a US model. The US model, if you look at the mass median diameter is about 0.26 microns. So uh, about 0.3 microns as uh, CDC would say, uh, but the count, the median diameter is actually uh, 75 nanometers. Um, the one that you use in Europe is a slightly different. Uh, this, is, this uses a photometer, so you can't really see the particle size. So you're looking at, the mass of um, uh, particles that are generated and, and how much you've captured. The machine is pretty well designed, it's pretty consistent. And at least the good thing is that we have a standard protocol for measuring everybody's mask. And so we come up with similar 
uh, protocols. Again, 85 liters a minute. If you have a uh, respirator that uses two, like a elastomeric respirator that uses two filters, then you do it at half of that, 42 and a half. And then you can download the data to a computer. Uh, you need the preconditioning, of course, as I indicated. But the loading is really important. Um, so this, this is showing you time versus uh, efficiency. And we begin to load it when, when we start, we, we are 97% efficiency. But very quickly, it drops to below 95%. And so clearly, if you just look at this initial efficiency, you're gonna, you're gonna be really happy because you have an N95, but in reality, you do not. So what NIOSH looks at is really the minimum efficiency or the maximum penetration. And so there are structures like this that um, are actually out there in the marketplace. Um, NIOSH says that you really have, as a function of loading, four behaviors. Either the efficiency doesn't change, or it increases, or it drops, or it goes up and comes down. Well, we don't really see that. The, the one that we see is the red, so we can see that the efficiency goes up. And this would be for something that I would call more of a surface filter. If you have more of a depth filter, as I showed earlier, it drops and then it picks back up when your mechanical efficiency picks up. And now you have also van der Waal forces and other things that contribute to capturing particles. So, and, and then if you have a behavior like this, it really means you have a leakage in, in, in the system, um, whether you, the way you mounted it or whether the system has a leakage. Um, so this is a leading brand. Um, so this is the kind of data that you generate. So this one starts at 99.6%, but it drops to 99.25%, it picks up. And so this is your efficiency that you report. And this is really what I was talking about in terms of the wear time. So, uh, you know, this one starts at about 120 pascals. Within 30 minutes of loading, you're 250 pascals. Uh, this would be unbelievably uncomfortable to wear. Of course, uh, if you look at this, this is 30 milligrams of salt. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very high degree of loading. So whether that happens in reality or not, um, I do not know, but the uh, initial pressure drop is obviously high, and then the final pressure drop is, is also really high. Let's switch gear to surgical masks. Surgical masks are regulated by FDA. Uh, we have a whole bunch of standards, um, and um, I've listed them here for your reference. Um, but this table is a summary of, again, where we are in the U.S. versus Europe. Um, so we look at bacteria efficiency testing, and of course we have three levels, um, the same here in, the Euro in, in Europe. So you have to be 98%, we are 95 or 98%. We have a particle efficiency test, which is not required in Europe. We have to be 95 or 98. We have a blood resistance, so this is the fluid resistance. Uh, it's not required in Europe for these two, uh, but it's required um, for the last one. The pressure drops uh, is ironic. They measure this in terms of millimeters of water per centimeter squared. And so just imagine you want to divide Pascals by centimeters squared. It's, I don't know what the unit is. Um, we have a flammability requirement and then you have a sampling requirement. Um, and I want to focus on this one because this is something that actually is completely misguided. Um, and um, we have been publishing and publicizing this, trying to get the standard to change and hopefully it will change. So with respect to the particle filtration efficiency, um, essentially the ASTM says you use neutralized particles. You can use 0.1 to 0.5, you choose the particle and you choose the face velocity, but then the sample size is not specified. So basically I can do whatever I want and I can give you whatever number I want. Uh, depending on how I test it. And um, so if I'm doing a face velocity, half a centimeter, and if I keep the area the same, you know, I can go with three liters a minute or 150 liters a minute. And that's really completely um, inaccurate uh, or uh, misguided. Uh, because if you look at the efficiency, it drops as a function of the flow rate. So this material is 99% at 30 liters a minute, at 85 liters a minute, it drops to uh, 93 and a half. And if you recall, we have to be right around here. So depending on the flow rate, you could actually fail. If you look at the FDA, came up with a guideline and says, well, we don't want you to use neutralized. We want you to use unneutralized. We want you to use 0.1 micron. But then they fail to specify the phase velocity or the sample size. 
And then they refer to this ASTM standard that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that's still the current standard. So if you look at in, in summary, this is what ASTM says. Uh, so neutralized, give you the particle sizes. FDA says this one. And Nelson Lab is one of the labs that's been doing this. Uh, they're a um, certified lab in the US. They've been doing this for a long time. So they put the two together and came up with this. So 0.1 micron, uh, 5.2 centimeter per second, and the test area is, is a specified, the flow rate is specified. And uh, so they came up with a procedure that takes the best of both worlds and puts it together. So the challenge is this, that not all labs follow the same protocol. And so here we plot the phase velocity versus the efficiency at 0.1 micron. And this is, these are the particles that are neutralized and these are unneutralized. So this is where that Nelson lab measures here. And then lab two measures it here because they use a different phase velocity. Lab three measures it here. So something that would be a class three, the best surgical mask on the market, uh, tested by one lab would fail uh, if you send it to the other two labs. And, and this is really not a good situation because we don't have consistency across the board. And this is something again, that we have been advertising and talking about a great deal. Uh, let's focus on cloth masks. Um, of course, um, one of the things that everybody talks about is that the purpose of the cloth mask is to prevent the spread of the virus so that it slows down that exhalation and coughing and, and droplet formation. But then we have no guidelines in the US. In, in Europe, there are some guidelines. For example, in France, there are some guidelines. In Ireland, there are some guidelines. In Germany, there are some guidelines. We have currently none in the US. And that has led to um, a lot of products on the market that really have uh, essentially very little uh, efficacy. Uh, there was a new barrier mask standard um, that was formed. The committee uh, was led by one of the deputy directors at CDC. And um, I'll show you what, what they came up with in just a second. Um, I had a student exchange uh, stu student from Germany who actually looked at uh, cloth masks. Um, so Simon Sheik uh, looked at a whole bunch of different materials. I just took an example of some of the best selling products that we have on, on, on the market. Uh, Sport mask one is a knitted one, another knitted one. Pressure drops are okay, but if you look at their uh, respiratory protection, it's very, very low. Um, there's a community mask that uh, is a one-ply woven. It's very, very dense fabric. This would qualify for a parachute if you wanted to use it. It has an unbelievably high uh, uh, pressure drop and its efficiency is very low, relatively speaking. Um, this is a three-ply cotton. Th this is the most common in the US. Um, again, 15% efficiency. Uh, this one is a woven and a non-woven. The so pressure drop is high, 91% efficiency, but then they claim it's washable. And if you wash it once, you destroy that melt-on layer structure and this drops to about 15%. Um, there's a three-ply non-woven out there that's actually a very bad non-woven, about 24%. Um, so we just took some commercial surgical masks. And if you look at the surgical masks, if they had good fit, uh, they would actually provide really good respiratory protection. And then we took two uh, mouth loans. Uh, this, this one um, is used for surgical masks. This one is used in N95 masks. And you notice that they're all pretty good. Now, part of the reason for this is that the cloth masks do not have electrostatic charge. There's been a lot of attempts to do triboelectric charge and other, other ways of enhancing the structure, but that's, that's part of your problem uh, with the cloth masks. And then of course, there was, there was a whole bunch of studies on cloth masks. Um, they have concluded that they provide some level of protection um, if you had a sufficient distance. So they, they slow down the particles if you're coughing, speaking, um, and, and uh, uh, sneezing, they, they, drop, uh, they, they slow down the droplets um, to some degree, but you still need to do uh, significant social distancing um, in, in the presence of these cloth masks. Um, this study is really interesting because they looked at the number of particles that you could generate. Uh, um, for example, if you're sneezing, if you have no mask, you could be creating as many as 40,000 particles. Um, and if you're wearing an N95 mask, it, it catches all of them. If you're catching a surgical mask, uh, only 23 escape. 
if you're wearing a cloth mask, you, you've done not too badly, uh, even though, so, so they're really good in terms of, again, slowing down and capturing some of the larger droplets. And um, this is the cough drops, this was sneezing, and again, of course, fewer particles. And the message here was that, you know, the threshold for you to get sick is about a thousand droplets. So that, that means this one doesn't really protect you if somebody was sneezing because they're, they're creating over a thousand droplets, but for coughing, it would be okay. Um, so the message here is that, you know, I, uh, something is better than nothing. And so if you have no access to good masks, the cloth mask properly designed could uh, slow down the spread of the virus to some degree. Uh, the new ASDM standard um, is called the 3502-21, was issued February 15, 2021. The committee is already meeting to revise it because they came up with some controversial, controversial things in, in that standard as well. Uh, but the intent was to really uh, inform the community um, and come up with some guidance in terms of all of the things that we buy on Amazon and, and on, online that, that claim um, all kinds of things. Um, so the scope was really source control. So that means you want to control the source of the infection. So the leakage factor is, is now important as part of this design. And then they are also setting some standards for the degree of filtration in terms of respiratory protection. And of course, uh, if you look at it, they're using the same technique that NIOSH is using for N95s. So they use the same TSI 8130, they use the same procedure. However, they do not do the loading test. Uh, so they're not looking at the loading test, they're looking at that initial efficiency. And uh, of course, they're also not looking at oil particles, uh, they're only looking at salt particles. Again, the, the same procedure, so you now also use the same machine to say uh, what the pressure drop is. Uh, you should, all you have to do is just turn off the aerosol and measure the pressure drop, so that initial pressure drop and efficiency. And however, the testing still has to be done by an accredited lab. And of course, you have to be certified according to the ISO 17025. Uh, and so you know, labs like Eurofin, Nelson Labs, Intertac, and others uh, are certified to do these kinds of things. They also tell you to mount the mask like you do with the N95 masks. Um, however, they give you no guidance if you do not have this type of a device because a cup holds its shape. So we actually have been working on a cage. And so this is what we use um, for testing the ASDM using this. And essentially we, we mount the uh, material and put, put this on there and then it goes into the machine. So there's other ways to do it. Uh, people are printing the ISO face shape and using that um, to do that. So there's a lot of development here, uh, but ASDM doesn't specify exactly how you would do this. So you would have to figure it out. Uh, they've set two levels, level one, 20% efficiency and 50% efficiency, and then 15 millimeters of water, or roughly 150 pascals, roughly 50 pascals. Um, however, the difference is that you could be level one at um, efficiency, but you could be level two. So it's not either or, so you, you can be either or. So you, you, can, you can be level two in terms of your uh, filtration efficiency, but level one in terms of your uh, pressure drop. So you, 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 can, you can report that. There's a very extensive report that you have to fill out. And then this is, this is the way you would visually report uh, essentially what you have. So um, you talk about filtration efficiency, so low performance, high performance, and you say, this is mine. And then 15 millimeter low performance, five millimeter high performance, you say, this is mine. So visually at least, the consumer can see um, what they're getting. And so that is, is not, it's not uh, as it is today. Um, so basically it's been what I call the wildest wild west over the last year, uh, especially with cloth masks and everything that's been going on. Um, we're beginning to see some really good new innovations and of course new regulations. So we're becoming a lot smarter in terms of what not to do. And I think uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, to collaborate. So with that, I want to stop and see if you have any questions and we look forward to uh, collaborating.